You thought we were out of killer rules to steal from the 4th edition Dungeon Master's Guide? Well, you were flat out wrong. We at it again, my friend. We're back with 5 more rules from 4e that you should consider dropping into your 5e D&D or 2e Pathfinder game. Let's dive into the familiar waters of this vibrant pool to remind us one more time about how disappointing the 2014 DMG is. First, let's talk about your campaign theme. Your campaign's theme is the overarching story structure or the glue that holds it all together. For a new DM, this may all seem a little too lofty when you're just trying to make it from one session to the next, and you certainly don't need to know how everything fits together before you get going. It's often revealed based on the choices your players make, and when you're running a published adventure, all that is pretty much determined for you. But the 4th edition DMG offers a few options here to help you figure out the kind of campaign you want to run. We've got Dungeon of the Week, On a Mission, Ultimate Villain, world-shaking events, unfolding prophecy, and divine strife. Many of these are closely related and have lots of overlap, but let's dig in a little more to each one and find out how they could be useful to you. Dungeon of the Week is the most simple type of campaign to run. It's like the law and order of campaigns, where each session follows a formula and the world does not undergo massive shifts across the campaign. This is perfect if your party is playing some kind of fantasy detective agency and each session, a new dame with great gams walks in asking for help. I once ran a version of this with Watsi's Candlekeep Mysteries, which is 16 kind of related adventures set inside or connected to a great library. We made the party Candlekeep Cops, and for each one-shot session, they had to solve a new mystery related to a library book. The On a Mission campaign type is only slightly more interconnected where the adventures are still episodic, but they're all working toward an ultimate goal. Using my Candlekeep Cops example, I could have had them working toward the ultimate goal of unlocking tombs deep underneath the Candlekeep itself. Then we have the Ultimate Villain type of campaign, where episodic adventures lead to a final confrontation with a big bad. The easiest comparison here is every Zelda game ever, where Link has to find all the pieces of the Triforce, or gather enough strength to wield the Master Sword. Only then can he become strong enough to face Ganon. And very closely related is the campaign type of world-shaking event. This is often part of the Ultimate Villain's plan. The bad guy has released a bunch of water elementals into the Underdark below an active volcano, and now it's destabilized and finna erupt and destroy the town near it. Or it could just be that unexplained earthquakes or hurricanes are wreaking havoc on some population. Regardless of the reason for the world-shaking event, it's up to the party to find out why it's happening and how to stop it all. The Unfolding Prophecy type of campaign is a flavor of either Ultimate Villain or World-Shaking events. This is an explanation for why these things are happening. It was foretold. It's up to the PCs to interpret and solve the prophecy before the bad guy or bad events do it for them. I like to think of the video game The Last of Us as a twist on the unfolding prophecy genre. Ellie is immune to the infection and so her blood is the one thing that can save humanity. Joel has to deliver her to the doctors to fulfill the prophecy. And finally, Divine Strife is a campaign related to the PCs getting caught up in a conflict that's initially above their pay grade, feuding gods, warring nations, etc. It's up to the players to pick a side and to help end the conflict. How does it help you to know this? Well, you won't often know exactly where your campaign will be in 5 or 10 sessions. It's helpful to be able to drop in hints of things to come. If you know the type of campaign you're running, then those long game bits of foreshadowing will pay off much better. Next, let's talk about creating an encounter script. The book gives advice about planning for combat encounters by running them in your head before you get to the table. Think about the terrain, the party, and the enemies and give yourself a rough idea of what you want your baddies to do, at least for the first round. When I was a new DM, I resisted doing this because I figured that the bad guys wouldn't likely pre-plan their attack before combat, so I didn't want to quote unquote metagame. But the problem with that is my players would too often kick the crap out of my baddies with little trouble. When it comes to players versus DMs, there's many more of them and only one of you, so they can strategize and work together in ways you can't. If you're running spellcaster baddies, how will they conduct themselves in combat? I like to think about high initiative and low initiative options. Can they drop a fireball? Will they try to charm a PC to fight for them? If you're running martial baddies, do they operate by training or by instinct? Both can lead to effective combat tactics. Do they team up against weaker enemies? Do they provide cover for each other? If you use monster rolls from my other 4th edition DMG video, it can help you decide what the monsters will do on their turns. 
Having an encounter script, even a vague idea of one, can help take the pressure off during combat and also speed things up. Third on our list is starvation, thirst, and suffocation. Unfortunately, there's only a brief section in the book about this. It talks of the rule of three here. Three weeks without food, three days without water, and three minutes without air. D&D is often a game of resource management in the form of spell slots and hit points, but there are other resources you can manage as well. A lot of DMs and players think tracking rations and water skin levels is too fiddly, and I get that. If you had to track it all the time, constantly, it would probably be annoying. You can usually find abundant food in towns, and fresh water if there's a river around. Certain spells can make having clean food and drink a non-issue, but consider adding the element of ration tracking and water management during, say, deep dungeon delves. Maybe in certain highly magical places, clean water is spoiled, and no decanter of endless water or goodberry spell works here. Then it becomes a minigame with consequences like levels of exhaustion when the resources run dry. Again, not all the time, but it doesn't hurt to spice things up from time to time by giving the players different sorts of problems to deal with. There's also a brief section in the book on delegating. I won't go into great detail on this since I covered it pretty extensively in my video on tips for paying better attention in D&D games, but I'll give a brief overview. The book says if you're feeling overwhelmed as a DM, consider farming out some of your responsibility to your players. Make someone the rule looker upper. Put someone in charge of taking overall notes for the group or tracking initiative. Have someone keep track of when to take breaks. It can be hard to cede control of these things at times, but you've already got so much to do as a GM. Some of your players will like having the extra responsibility in being able to help out, especially for the types who get bored when not actively in the spotlight. Finally, let's talk about game modes. In certain TTRPGs like Blades in the Dark, there are defined segments of the game to put play into phases. In Blades, it's free play slash information gathering phase, to score phase, to downtime phase, repeating in an endless cycle. This gives form and structure to the game, and it works there. D&D and Pathfinder are generally more loosey-goosey in their management of time, as you'll shift from combat to exploration to social interaction and downtime whenever the situation calls for it. But the fourth edition lists five specific modes for the game. Setup, Exploration, Conversation, Encounter, and Passing Time. Setup is what happens at the beginning of a session when explaining what the players need to know before they begin making choices. Exploration is when the PCs physically move through the game world, going places and doing things that are not strictly encounters. Conversation is the back and forth between the players and the GM, or the PCs and relevant NPCs. This is the social aspect. Encounters are traps, puzzles, skill challenges, and combat. And finally, passing time is downtime or the things that don't fit into any previous category. I don't think it's helpful for the GM to say, okay, now we're moving from setup to exploration. Your session doesn't have to be so rigid and delineated, but I do think it's helpful for the GM to consider what is your role during each of these modes? How do you behave differently during exploration versus encounters? How can you best serve the players during these times? Anyway, that's five even more excellent rules to pilfer and abscond into the night straight out of the fourth edition Dungeon Master's Guide. Check out the first video in this mini-series here, and if you still haven't picked up this book, just check it out for the artwork. I mean, look at this. How cool is that? Do yourself a favor. Also, how about a like and subscribe below? I sure would appreciate it. Until next time, this is GM Jim. Now go run yourself some slightly retro D&D.